Welcome to a new episode of European School Net podcast series. My name is Laura Lindbergh, and we are here today to talk about education and more particularly about how education is changing. In the last decade, we have seen many changes affecting all society, but in particular, we have seen how the different governments across Europe have been implementing new strategies to support the education community to embrace change and to adapt to a new reality which is very much influenced by technology. To help overcome the current fragmentation, organizations such as European Schoolnet is trying to foster the synergies between the different national actors involved and also to understand what are the different national initiatives. Today, we are going to discuss about the new different uh, transition plans. And in particular, we're going to focus on the transition plan for education in Portugal. Uh, we're going to present also uh, the recent case study launched by European Schoolnet on this particular plan. But for that, let me welcome our two guests. First of all, I would like to introduce you to Maria Joao Horta, who's representing the Ministry of Education of Portugal, and uh, she's here as the uh, Deputy Director General for the Department of Education. Also, I would like to introduce you to my colleague, Patricia Bastio, who's uh, working uh, at the European School Net as the Principal Advisor on Research and studies, and is also the co-author of the recent case study related to the system change in Portugal. So welcome both. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you. Good morning. Thanks for joining to this episode. What I said before, we're going to look at one case study recently published uh, where we talk among everything about system change. But I would like to start uh, asking you a few questions, uh, starting with you, Patricia, um, about fragmentation. I mentioned it before, there is fragmentation in how the education system are embracing change. And it will be uh, good to understand uh, what is fragmentation and also what do you think about the importance of fostering synergies and about um, policy learning? Yes, indeed. Uh, usually when we refer to fragmentation, we mean that this is the result of um, lack of coordination, of collaboration, of transversal integration that occurs when policy designers and implementers fail to consider the implication of policies, programs, regulation that have been developed independently. And in absence of such integration, uh, when the reform or the policy uh, enter the doors of the schools, teachers and school leaders are left to make sense and connect the dots, as we say, between multiple expectations. And in reaction to that, every school, or almost every school, has its own way to solve that challenge. So, and in digital education, uh, the risk of fragmentation is increased for two main reasons. One is that there are more stakeholders involved in digital education compared to other, re or other areas. For example, large IT companies uh, providing platform and infrastructure to schools, as well as startup uh, developing digital learning content. They are also part of the landscape. And because they, the, the result is that we have more actors, uh, the lack of coherence uh, might appear more easily. And the second reason why uh, digital education is really at risk of fragmentation is, as you already mentioned it uh, yourself, Laura, um, te for technology to bring a pedagogical benefit, uh, it often requires a change of role for teachers, for students, and in many cases, even a change of mindset. And again, every school or almost every school has its own way of meeting this challenge. 
uh, depending on the professional beliefs of teachers and, and educators involved. So all these introduce a lot of differences what may lead to the, the fragmentation. But I really want to, to highlight one point. The solution to fragmentation is in no way a one-size-fits-all approach. On the contrary, uh, adaptation to context is really a prerequisite for system change success and flexibility is crucial as much as ensuring the original intention of the reform and its purpose. So this is precisely why uh, European Schoolnet is undertaken activities um, to uh, improve policy learning specifically. So it's about ensuring that policy designers and implementers will share experiences, reflect on their respective different contexts. Uh, policy learning is really about supporting mutual learning, uh, knowledge building, co-construction uh, of evidence um, and within and across system. So policy learning is an approach that recognizes that change processes are highly context dependent. The aim of policy learning approach is, is the opposite of policy transfer or policy borrowing. And it's one of the reasons why we are very cautious about speaking of good practices. It's not about recipe that you can copy paste. It's a much more deeper process involving learning at policy designer and, and implementation implementers level. So policy learning is, is particularly important now with the increased integration of technology in the school as a result of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, but also the um, entry of platforms into school, what we call platformization, and also now with the more recent growing presence of artificial in intelligence. And um, so it means that there is a lot to be learned. There is no pre-existing solution to all the issues that this development are creating. So this is why we, we have uh, developed this series of case studies, system change case studies at uh, European Schoolnet to support policy learning through case studies. And uh, it, it is supposed to ensure the, the learning at country level. So the country that is the topic of the, the, poly, the case study is supposed to learn something. And the other countries uh, facing similar challenge will also uh, learn from uh, the, the case study. So this is the, the purpose of this new collection. And indeed, as you mentioned, uh, we start with Portugal, it's our first issue, and the Digital Transition Action Plan uh, implemented in Portugal. And in the case study, we, we look at the context, the overall strategy behind the plan, uh, the, key, the key element of the plan, and uh, we propose some learning points for discussion, and we also made recommendations for the sustainability of, of the plan in the long term. Many thanks, Patricia. I think it was quite interesting to, to listen to what you said because uh, you clarified many things about fragmentation. Now I would like to uh, ask Maria Joao something which is more related to the transition plan in Portugal, uh, which is uh, basically what is the journey because uh, we can read in the case study uh, that the plan uh, is already, we can see uh, that this is really um, in a way supporting and making some progress in how uh, we embed technologies in school. But what is the journey, uh, the journey that the Ministry of Education has followed and uh, in particular when and, and why it is started? Okay, thank you, Laura. Um, I think that I can say for now that it's a long journey. Uh, and I would like to, to underline that uh, this Portugal digital transition plan is not an isolated decision that was made in uh, 20, 2020. At the time, it was, um, uh, it was a Council of Ministers resolution. We were in the beginning of the uh, pandemic, but uh, this was already uh, foreseen in policies. 
at the time we were uh, doing a lot of work in terms of the new law for inclusion that we have since to 2018 and at the same time with the curriculum flexibility new new curriculum in portugal and also uh, very connected with the strategy for citizenship. So this um, digital transition plan in Portugal, it was not a kind of a bubble that uh, we decided to do because of pandemic. Of course, as I, I told you, um, it was foreseen and uh, the, with the pandemic, we accelerated the decisions, but it was connected with the work that we already were doing uh, with the schools. Uh, so at the time, as I told you, with this um, uh, Council of Ministers resolution then they decided um, that they will uh, invest in terms of infrastructure buying computers laptops for all students and for all teachers and even having Portugal as a small country uh, if we compare with the others in in um, Europe but at the time it, we uh, bought more than 1 million laptops so all the students and all the teachers they receive it during 2020 and during the beginning of 2021, a laptop and um, and also uh, a modem for connectivity because we were with schools uh, closed, but the students, they are with the families at home, but the connection with teachers and all the learning processes, this, we, we keep it on. Um, we knew because we have other programs in Portugal before that, this one, that putting computers and the internet, it was not the only dimension that matters when we speak about digital education. So that's why at the time we already, uh, with this uh, program to buy computers, we designed a huge uh, program for professional development of our teachers. And we began also designing um, new uh, digital resources uh, for education. So this is the, um, the, the environment uh, and the ecosystem where uh, we work. Um, a kind of a very top-down approach at the moment, but since the early beginning, we began to work with schools uh, and with other stakeholders that I can say that they were in a kind of the middle layer um, to uh, have the, 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 the strategies coming also from the schools. So we were doing some kind of designing at the top down, at the top level, but we were very close to the schools for them to also react and begin to design their own strategies at the local level. Many thanks, Maria Jo. I think it was an interesting journey that will still uh, uh, remain because if I understand correctly, uh, this is a journey and this is a plan that this is still implemented right yeah, yeah, now. Yeah, 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 yeah. We are at least um, the, the, the main actions will still have them till the end of uh, 2025. And of course, because of the study that I have to, to say that it was very, very important for us, the, the study con conducted by the European School Net, we are looking to the recommendations and uh, very aware about uh, the sustainability of, uh, of this investment and not just the investment in terms of uh, financial uh, resources, but also in terms terms of uh, uh, investing in the human resources and all the work that we are still doing with schools. So speaking about sustainability, it's very, very important because the things are not going to stop in the end of 2025. We have to uh, relook to all the things that we are doing and uh, see the strategy for this uh, sustainability that we really uh, uh, have to be aware of. Great. Patricia, I'm just uh, looking at you because um, when we read also the study, there is something uh, related to pedagogy first approach, which seems that it's one of, uh, of the key, uh, mm -hmm. let's say, um, approaches or elements that you highlight in, in the case study about the, the Portuguese plan. Indeed, um, in general, pedagogy first is, is a very challenging objective of, of many reform. And in the case of the in the case of Portugal, let's say not only the plan, but the, the whole policy about digital education uh, is really pedagogy first uh, driven, let's say. What does it mean? It means that 
the selection of technology, the way it is it is integrated into uh, the practice, um, is really driven by a teaching and learning purpose, and the purpose is supposed to be uh, to to be in place and to be explicit before even selecting and using the technology. So of course it's the same mirror at the practice level. So the, the objective is for teachers, school leaders to choose tools that will intentionally support specific learning objective and pedagogical objective. So this is what this uh, pedagogy first uh, refer to. And uh, in Portugal, this, this pedagogical, pedag pedagogy first approach to digital education uh, is in place and has led us to choose uh, the analytical framework for the case studies that is proposed by Michael Fullen as our reference framework for the analysis. Uh, Fullen's framework considered the role of technology in education as a means to catalyze further improvement and innovation in pedagogy. So it's not pedagogy for the sake of pedagogy, or it's not technology for the sake of technology, but it's really technology to support pedagogy. And uh, so the, the Fullen's analytical model is based on a decade of observation and discussion in school, what is very important, and also advice to, to government but really trying to act at both levels, so at the, the, the top level where the policy is designed and at the school level where it has to be implemented. Uh, and it also has the advantage of being very clear and accessible to all, what is also important for transparency reason. So um, it looks at uh, uh, three main uh, area and perspective that are very closely related. The first one is pedagogy, of course, really leading the end, the rest. And then the second one is technology. And the third one is knowledge for change. And this one is really important because it's very often neglected in, in the analysis of reform and transformation initiative, while it is extremely important when you think in terms of system change because it concerns all the other areas around pedagogy and technology that has to be in place for the change to happen. So for example, it looks at how contagion mechanism can take place in the system. Uh, what is the transparency that is implemented for everyone to be aware of the purpose? Uh, what is, how, to which extent the, the focus is on the capacity building of all the players. Uh, it also makes some recommendation about choosing technology that is attractive from a learning point of view, and so on and so forth. So, and the most important aspect uh, related to change, uh, knowledge for change, is the importance of the educational leadership. And here we, we refer to an educational leadership that ensure this condition that I just mentioned, uh, to be present for a successful implementation at system-wide level. So in this case study analysis, um, we have used that uh, full and model to analyze the, the transition plan in Portugal, but we have also used evidence uh, coming from research, <coughs> sorry, other areas of research, for example, uh, what do we know about the condition for effective professional development or what do we know about mechanism for spreading innovation at system level? Um, so just to conclude our without entering in detail in the in the result of the case study, uh, indeed we have observed that the Portugal pedagogy first approach to um, digital education, has included national support for and significant, really significant investment in teacher professional development in, in digital uh, education that was supported by the post-pandemic uh, recovery and resilience funds. And uh, the use was very purposeful. Thanks, Patricia. To understand better and maybe to, to just give to our audience uh, in a national 
uh, what are the elements of the uh, of the digital uh, education uh, plan? Um, I'm now just turning to Maria Joao. Uh, would you be able to summarize uh, what are these uh, key elements of the the plan, so that uh, other also other stakeholders could be inspired by what you did? Yeah, okay. Uh, well. Uh... In general, I think that I can say that we are not doing very different from many other countries. Because I think that uh, many countries are doing like this, investment in equipment and infrastructure, investment in professional development of their own teachers, and at the same time thinking about digital resources. So uh, uh, I, I, I'm looking and I'm speaking with colleagues of mine. Uh, they are doing more or less the same in other countries. So um, I think that um, one, one thing that could be a bit different is this connection between other areas um, of change inside the schools and the vision for the success of all our students. So when we speak about the, the, the learning outcomes and the success of about, uh, uh, all our children, we are uh, speaking not just about uh, uh, digital education. We are speaking uh, in a, a much broader sense. We are speaking about uh, migrants that are uh, arriving in our schools. We are speaking about all the things connected with the uh, citizenship, uh, inclusion, and so on. So we have to see where does digital education fits on all of this. So when we uh, speak with the principals, with the teachers, the things should be connected, should be connected when Coming back to, to this uh, pedagogical uh, approach, this should be connected with inclusion and with curriculum. Otherwise, uh, some teachers will use the digital tools, others are not going to, to do that. So, first of all, this, uh, as Patricia was saying, this knowledge for change. First, schools teachers, leaderships, they should understand that with, the, with this vision for digital education, they could improve in general the, the, the work that they are doing with their, their students. Um, and uh, if they agree with this vision and if they accept that uh, this could be a good uh, way of promoting the, the inclusion and success of all students, then they have to learn about it. But when they are going to learn about it, it's not just because they are curious about it, it's that it's because they understand the, the changing and the knowledge that they have to do to uh, do the best in their own classrooms with their own students. Um, and for that, you need stakeholders at a, at a, in a kind of a middle layer. Otherwise, it will be very difficult to target all these things. That's why we decided to put a lot of knowledge in these uh, training centers that we have all around our country. And at the same time, using the uh, ICT content centers that we have at the level of uh, universities, Institute of Education, and so on. So this is, um, in the end, teachers are not just doing one course or one workshop about digital tools. It's, it's much more than that, is, is getting this new vision and be committed with this vision uh, for, them, uh, for them then to have support at the local level with all this uh, network of knowledge that we are putting in the, in the, in the country. Because uh, many, m putting just financial resources uh, in, the, in the problem, it will be not enough. You have to have this network of knowledge and having people speaking with each other. Uh, uh, otherwise, the innovation stays just in small bubbles inside the school. Uh, so the communication, the spreading all this vision and uh, having this uh, dialogue and having, well, practices being chaired at the national level, but also regional level. This uh, is putting this huge machine, which is education, uh, moving uh, to this vision uh, of, uh, of having uh, uh, this diversity inside the schools, but at the same time um, giving capacity to our teachers to deal with uh, all this diversity. 
Great. Thanks, Maria Joao. Uh, yeah, listening to, to the plan, uh, I'm just thinking, uh, yeah, what uh, the case study has to say in terms of um, not just the analysis, but also the recommendations that uh, in a way uh, are also of interest for uh, uh, for the Ministry of Education of Portugal. Patricia, uh, you have been working on it, um, but uh, you are not the only one because I would like to remind that this case study it has been authored by uh, Patricia from European School Net, but also uh, in collaboration with Janet Looney from the European Institute of Education and Social Policy, and also uh, Professor Marlan Pere from the University of, of Tallinn. But uh, going back to the question, Patricia, um, if you have to highlight some recommendations that you're giving in the case study, um, what uh, what would you like to share today with our audience? Um, yes, indeed. Maybe to start to to highlight the fact that uh, uh, through our study visit and uh, the desk research and the many interviews we've had uh, on on site. Um, it appears clear to us that uh, Portugal made really significant progress in supporting schools to integrate digital uh, education. Most teacher and school leaders, and we speak about 92% of them, have participated in training on digital education, and almost all schools in Portugal uh, have action plan uh, outlining how they integrate technology to support learning and tracking uh, their progress. Uh, it doesn't mean that it's an ideal world because the reality is diverse and fragmented like everywhere, but at least that effort has been successful uh, from uh, thanks to the plan. So indeed, together with uh, Janet Looney and Marc Lampere, uh, we have worked on 12 recommendations because we wanted to focus on the most important point and uh, in three directions. Some recommendation to widen the reach and impact of uh, the digital transformation to more school. Uh, the second uh, area is the deepening of the planned achievement till now, particularly at the level of skills. Uh, acquisition and the third dimension is around how to sustain the program in the long term. I will only refer to three, one of each category, to three recommendations uh, rather briefly. Um, so as I explained nonetheless the significant progress, the degree to which schools and teachers have integrated digital education in, in regular practice uh, vary, varies widely. Uh, barriers to take up may include poor digital infrastructure, sometimes connectivity issue, sometimes in, in rural areas, nonetheless effort, it's difficult to have a stable connection, and sometimes low teacher efficacy regarding digital education. So what we suggest as a, one of the recommendations is that a first step could be to better understand specifically what are the reasons why teacher and school leader may be reluctant to integrate digital education content in their school and classroom practices and through discussion and cooperation with them to find ways to address their concerns so significant change in practice not only in the use of, of digital education content but in the shift to more learner-centered approach to, to practice uh, requires school leaders and teachers to also shift beliefs, mindset about teaching and learning, and the discussion with those that may have more difficulties to get there or less agree with it uh, may be an interesting way to go to widen the impact of, um, of the plan, the transition plan, and uh, subsequent activities related to, to it. Uh, but of course, it could be done, for example, in cooperation with a university based in, in Portugal to really develop the clear and well-grounded and in-depth understanding of what are the concerns of those that are lagging behind. An example from the, the deepening um, area in terms of uh, recommendation 
is to support schools to build their training plans uh, from a strategic whole school perspective. What is more than, of course, the addition of individual teachers' training need. So every school has to produce a, a PADE, so that is their strategic plan and policy to implement digital education within the school. And um, thanks to the PADE, it has already reinforced the school's strategic capacity to integrate technology. But and almost all schools have, have submitted their, their plans, but it's not because everything is well written in a plan that it, it necessarily means that it is translated into practice and the, the capacity of the school to come with a whole school training plan is, is ensured. So we, during interviews uh, on, on site, we have discussed this, this aspect with several stakeholders uh, involved in uh, training the school, training, providing training during the, the, the transition plan too. And they themselves consider that several schools still need some support in that direction. So this is why we, we suggested that uh, uh, as the transition plan still is still in place till the end of 2025, to possibly dedicate uh, some attention and provision, uh, training provision, to help the school to develop their capacity to translate their school plan, strategic plan, into a training plan specifically, uh, balancing individual training needs with a whole school strategic uh, approach as uh, described in their, in their paddy. The third example, uh, and I will stop with this one, um, it's about the sustainability and uh, really the, the one I've chosen relate to uh, the infrastructure update and uh, the renewal and next generation of digital resources. So we know that uh, there is some uh, obsolescence of equipment um, everywhere. So there is a need to plan ahead the next wave of, for example, laptop replacement, because it has been broadly distributed, and uh, update of, of the hardware uh, in the five to four to five years to come. Um, also to dedicate attention to the development of uh, open educational resources uh, through different ways as, as it fits with the Portuguese system. It could be micro grants, it could be building a market for high quality teacher generated educational content on certified platform and so on and so forth. So another area still related to the update would be um, to plan ahead the next phase of the digital science lab uh, that includes uh, that could include technologies like virtual reality, augmented reality, use of drones, and and so on and so forth. And also a last area that is very important in Portugal, as we have seen, is the next generation of uh, digital textbook uh, that maybe should look in particular to. Uh, increasing the interoperability, improving uh, the use and uh, the collection of learning analytics, maybe supported by artificial intelligence, and also teacher and, and learner agency in adapting, personalizing the learning resources uh, and, and learning pathway. So uh, this is just uh, an example of three recommendations that we, we concluded would be relevant for uh, the, um, the future of the, the transition plan in Portugal. Thanks. And uh, yeah, maybe Maria Joao, do you want to add uh, something about what's next in this implementation now that you, you have uh, listened to these recommendations? What's in the pipeline now? Okay, so as Patricia um, said, we have 11, 11, isn't it, uh, Patricia, 11 recommendations. So uh, we are looking very carefully to all of these recommendations. Um, we are addressing them, we are discussing them with other stakeholders uh, at regional level, local level, but also at 
uh, top level, uh, at, the, um, at the, the level of the policy decision. Uh, we have now a new government, so we have to present the things that we already um, have achieved and we have to discuss how are we going to address all these uh, recommendations, uh, as I was telling you. Uh, but at the same time, uh, and uh, uh, we, we have to, um, to look uh, to the agency of our students and our families, because they have also <laughs> uh, a word in these uh, decisions that uh, we have we we have to to take. For instance, the things about well-being, time on the screens, all of these issues, we are discussing them uh, because um, we have to look these different sides of the same. Uh, the same topic, because sometimes we think that uh, all the decisions should be uh, taken at the level of Ministry of Education or at the level of the schools, but in the end we are working for students. Uh, so um, this uh, sometimes um, make us um, stop a bit uh, and uh, discuss and go deeper in this kind of things because when you have all the students with the laptops and uh, at the same time we are doing this transition for digital resources uh, even at the level of the textbooks putting them in uh, in digital we have to we, we begin with other issues that we didn't have in the beginning uh, and again uh, listening the students listening the the families and looking to the research we need and we feel the lack of some research about uh, digital well-being times in screen types of activities that students should do at schools or um, shouldn't do at schools and the same at home that's why we have to also uh, have the, this enrollment of the families um, so I think that we uh, this is a long journey. We did just uh, a small part, I think, because uh, we have a lots of, uh, of things that we should uh, should uh, should uh, discuss. Uh, and uh, just to finish, also uh, the data that uh, using all these digital tools, we are producing a lot of data, data that it's very interesting to work with the, the students, um, that teachers should look at that data. And I think that we are not still at the, that level and we should go deeper also uh, in terms of analytics and uh, all the data that matters for students and for teachers and also for families. So uh, long journey till now, but I think that in the future, the journey will be longer than this path. We are just in the beginning. Many thanks. Very interesting. And just uh, before we conclude the episode, I would like to ask you a last question, which is uh, really, um, yeah, a reflection on this uh, case study exercise. Um, did you learn something new? There was something that surprised you uh, when uh, you 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 read the findings, the recommendations. Um, and this is a question for both of you. So maybe Patricia, you want to start. Um, I have to say that what, what I was uh, surprised and impressed by to see functioning is this intermediate level. We didn't speak about it till now, but uh, in, in policy, combining top down and bottom up is always a, a very big challenge, a very important challenge. And in Portugal, uh, they have this kind of very well developed intermediate level through uh, teacher training centers to which school relate to digital ambassadors and ICT competence center. And this really network the entire territory and make the connection between the school and the ministry. And it is really amazing to see how it works and how it succeed to really spread, contaminate uh, the, the, whole, the whole system uh, at least in principle. Of course, you always have pockets that are not so advanced, but in principle, it, it's really a fantastic uh, uh, net networking, let's say, uh, to observe. Maria Joao, do you have anything to add? Well, um, I, I'm just um, going to add that um, 
when we are very committed at the different levels in, um, in producing this uh, knowledge for change, then we have this vision that we are good doing the, the things uh, the better we can. Uh, and sometimes uh, when you arrive even a small in a small community, small schools, and you begin to discuss directly with students and teachers, and I'm doing this more and more. I'm visiting more and more the schools to see what is going on uh, there. Then when you listen to the students, um, they, they have uh, their own vision about, about uh, the thing. And then when you have the students saying, OK, um, we think that uh, using digital tools, uh, it's important for us. But and you, when you listen this but, <laughs> you begin a bit to, to jaking, uh, because then, well, uh, Sometimes when we are very committed and very involved in specific programs, we tend to forget other issues that are as important as these ones in terms of uh, getting a better education for all. And um, I keep, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm having some surprising when some surprises when I visit the schools and I see all the investment that schools are doing, but um, being there and uh, having this discussion with the students and teachers and uh, with families also uh, brings me and brings us um, more and more challenges uh, because we really should be a very uh, uh, very strong when we take decisions and sometimes it's difficult to take decisions because you become balanced between different uh, dimensions that in the beginning you didn't address them uh, but having the vision this outside vision that we bring with this study that Ewen and Patricia and the, the team produce it's it's really very relevant uh, for us. Looking to all these recommendations, it really makes a difference because it's an, an external vision that addresses uh, these specific situations that uh, we really have to take in account to, to, to be sure that uh, all the investment that we are doing, in the end, the impact, it's a, a positive impact in all these dimensions, not just in digital education. So thank you both, Maria, Joao, Patricia, for sharing with us uh, this interesting journey, this interesting uh, system change in Portugal. And um, now I would like to end just saying that this case study is available on the website of European Schoolnet. If you want to find more information, is there. I hope that the audience has also learned something today about uh, digital change. And uh, as uh, we normally invite you to do, uh, you can follow us and subscribe to the European School Net podcast series. So that's all from me. Thank you very much and see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.